on. That's our scripture of the month, our scripture of the month. Thank you for bearing with us. Uh, I, I know it's, it seems like it gets warm and it gets cold and it gets warm, gets cold. Uh, we actually have the new thermostat standing right here, sitting right here. And uh, we've got the technician that is working on going to put those in. Uh, but the thermostats are not being consistent. You know, there's something to be said about consistency in life, whether it's a thermostat, whether it's a refrigerator, whether what it is, maybe even it's the Christian. You know, sometimes we, we, we get irritated with the thermostat. It's up and it's down. It's not holding. And boy, there's a spirit. I, I always tell my wife, I feel a devotion coming on right there. Amen. And I think there's a great deal about being consistent in our Christian life. And uh, but Isaiah chapter 25, I, I'm sorry, Isaiah chapter 25. Let's read our scripture of the month together. Isaiah 25, 1. O Lord, thou art my God, I will exalt thee, I will praise thy name, for thou hast done wonderful things, thy counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. Isaiah 25, 1. Wonderful. I want to encourage you on the welcome displays to grab a, a, a scripture of the month card. And uh, grab your scripture card, put it in your Bible, uh, put it on your refrigerator, put it on your computer screen, put it somewhere where you're going to see it. Now turn back with me to the book of uh, Exodus, Exodus chapter 14 this morning. And I'm going to give you a heads up. Just a few minutes, I think in point number one or point number two, we're going to go to the Old Testament book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4. And so Habakkuk's one of those little books of the Bible that's sandwiched into that little section of the Bible known as the Minor Prophets that, that when you open your pages they go... They don't get a lot of much action in there. And uh, so I'll help you uh, by way of a little heads up to find that. Let me just take a, a, just a brief moment here as we start our morning service and say thank you uh, for everybody's uh, consideration. An understanding right now in our country we have a, 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 a lot of a great divide there's a political divide there's a lot of philosophic divide there's a lot of a divide on what to do and how to respond appropriately and correctly uh, to this coronavirus and so this is what we're going to do in Romans chapter 14 it talks about uh, consideration for our brother amen uh, in Romans chapter 14 it deals with brothers in Christ uh, two Christians that have very strong convictions about which way things should be done or what's the right way to do it. And the Bible says that we need to consider one another. Uh, we need to do uh, those things. We need to keep our eyes on Christ. So listen, uh, different folks will have different uh, reactions to uh, the decisions that are made or the, well, the things that are going on. You know, it's okay. It's all right. Let them decide what's best for them and their family. Look, you decide what's best for you. You decide what's best for your family. You decide what's, uh, what you'd like to do. And uh, with God's help and God's grace, listen, we're just going to keep going forward. We're going to do it right. We're going to do it responsibly. We're going to try to make every accommodation we can reasonably can with this. But uh, with God's help, we're going to go forward. Now, this is where we need your uh, consideration. Look, over the next several months... We have no idea what's going to happen. We have no idea how this is going to pan out, what the, the, the federal government, our state governments are going to do, legislators, uh, the health department and all that. Uh, but listen, it, it, we're going to go forward, all right? It may be uh, halting and it may be jerking and uh, step forward or step back. Uh, but listen, it's going to be okay, amen? It's all going to be okay. So you pray. One of the things we do need to be responsible. Look, they're starting to really look at churches, and uh, they've clamped down on everybody else. They're starting to look at churches, so we need to make sure we're doing. We're being responsible. I don't want to see. Uh, not, number one, I don't want to see Rose Park Baptist Church become a place where people are getting sick. I want to see them where, where people are getting saved and people are getting baptized and people are going forward. Well, listen, we got to make sure we're using the sanitizer and scooching apart. And uh, one of the things we're going to. Uh, we've been very. Um, gotten very comfortable with fellowship time after church I can always tell a, 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 a happy church is one when I look at my watch and it's an hour after I stop preaching y'all are still hanging around and having a good time but we probably do need to be mindful of that and so give you all of that information right there but listen pray amen you say what can I do pastor pray and trust the Lord now Exodus chapter 14 this morning we're going to continue our series if you'll stand with me out of respect for God's word we're going to read one verse this morning our text verse Exodus chapter 14 verse 13 we'll stand this morning just going to read one verse of text if you can't stand if you can't stand that's absolutely fine for your health reasons but notice what the Bible has to say in Exodus chapter 14 and verse 13 and Moses said unto the people fear ye not 
stand still and see the salvation of the Lord which he will show you today for the Egyptians whom ye have seen today ye shall see them no more forever I love verse 14 I'm going to throw that in for free the Lord shall fight for you and ye shall hold your peace what a wonderful truth let's pray father we thank you so much for this day we thank you lord for your goodness and your gracious lord we do we come before you and god truly it's been said many times that we are a needy people but god we we are the sheep of your pasture and lord sheep are always needy they need food or they need rest or they need shelter or they need help or they need this or they need that and father we thank you lord that is a heart of a shepherd lord you never tire God, you never get tired of us coming to you, Lord, as your children and as your, as your flock and saying, oh, Father, we need you. And Lord, we do need you today. Father, we need you for our congregation. We pray, Lord, for not only our church, but God, I think of the churches, Lord, all over this country, all over this world. Father, some gatherings, great and small, but Lord, thank you for each and every church and church family. Father, we pray, dear Lord, that you might uh, be with them, strengthen them and help them. Father, we pray for those that have been infected by the COVID virus. Lord, would you please heal their bodies? We think of, Lord, the doctors and the nurses. We think of the folks in the nursing homes and the care facilities. And Lord, we think of those, Lord, uh, uh, Lord, the ambulance folks and the police officers and the firemen, Lord. And God, every single day, Lord, putting their life on their line for us. And Lord, we thank you for them. Please protect them and their families. God, we're asking you, dear Lord, truly, I believe our, our country, Lord, is stands lord in a great need of healing and help god i believe we're sick lord in every different way lord from the top of our head to the sole of our feet spiritually physically emotionally relationally and lord you're the only one that can heal a sick nation so god we come before you today we ask for your help father please watch over those lord in our church family lord that are suffering that are sick that are home this morning lord god would you encourage them Lord, we pray that you speak to us this morning from your word in Jesus' name, and amen. Thank you. you. may be seated this morning. Now, we're in a series called The Journey of Faith. The Journey of Faith. We looked at, first of all, that salvation is the beginning of the journey of faith. And that's how it started for Israel, and that's how it starts for us. Number two, then uh, we looked at, secondly, that sanctification is is the purpose of salvation that God says hey I love you and I want you to draw close to me then last week we looked at the privilege God's presence the privilege of redemption the fact that God wants to have a personal relationship with me not only does he want to draw close to me he wants us to have us close to him but he wants us to have a personal fellowshipping relationship with him now today we we're looking at message number four in this journey of faith the responsibility of the saved see up to this point it's all been on God God said look I'll save you God said look I'll bring you close God said look I want to initiate a relationship now God says hey it's time to begin to reciprocate in this relationship now I don't know about you but uh, have you ever tried to carry on a one-way conversation with somebody uh, it's difficult it's very very difficult to carry on that one-way conversation with someone uh, what about a one-way relationship? you have a friend or someone you're trying to be friend with, and you call them and they never call you and you, you text them and they never text you back you, you stop over and visit and they never stop you write them letters and they never write back and you're like okay does this person even care you know, if for a relationship to happen, somebody's got to initiate. Somebody once taught me this. In fact, one of, my, one of my pastors taught me this. You know what? In every great relationship, somebody has to die to themselves first. You know, that's what Jesus did. God said, I want to have a relationship with you. And so God the Son, he said, I'm going to die to my will. I'm going to die to my rights. I'm going to die to, and he said, I'm, I'm, willing, I'm willing to step out and have a relationship with you and he says I'll be the one to start that but for a relationship to continue it has to be reciprocal there's got to be times of give and there's got to be times of take and if there's two people that want to have a relationship whether it's a husband or a wife whether it's parents with children, whether it's a pastor with their church, or whether it's a Christian with their God, listen, there's got to be some give and there's got to be some take. God says, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go more than halfway. And God says, will you be interested in, in reciprocating? And so today we're going to look at two things, faith and obedience, the responsibility 
of the redeemed. The responsibility of the redeemed. For those of us who are saved and we know the Lord, you say, well, what's my part? Well, our part in our relationship with God is to have faith in God, number one. And number two, obedience to God. That's how we reciprocate to the Lord. Now, let me set the situation here. In, in Exodus chapter 14, oh, we've been studying this kind of chapter by chapter. You know, in Exodus chapter 12, God sent the Passover and he delivered. He broke the bondage. Exodus chapter 13, uh, Pharaoh said, go, go, get, get out of here and uh, get out of my land. And so they left. Now, in Exodus chapter 14, it's interesting. Now, notice, notice with me in verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel that they turn and encamp before Pihiroth, between Migdal and the sea. I worked all week so I could say that, right? Uh, between Migdal and the sea, over against Baal Zephon, before it ye shall encamp by the sea. And uh, we'll stop our reading there. And so the children of Israel, they came up out of the land of Egypt. Now, if you know your Bible geography, you know that uh, you have Egypt and it, it, it's on the Mediterranean Sea. And if they would just would have taken a left-hand turn and walked straight up northwest, they would have just went bent right into the promised land. But God says, no, instead of taking a left-hand turn, going to the north and west and being on your way, he said, I want you to go to the right. Uh, now, how many of you, by the signification of an upraised hand, will say this, Pastor, sometimes God has given me direction in my life that I don't understand. Would you raise your hand? Say, sometimes God has given... Thank you, you may put him down. You say, sometimes God has given me direction in my life and I just don't understand. That's exactly what God did here. The children of Israel, they, they, they thought, well, you know what? If we were to go this way, we would go to the left end, we'd just go right up through and take the shortcut. We'd be there in no time at all. But God said, no, you're going to go to the right hand. And they went south. Well, the promised land was north. And they went south and they went south. In fact, they went all the way down to where they were right smack up against the Red Sea. Now, you don't have to take your time here, but at some point, I encourage you, if you, if you don't have a, a mental image, and I meant to get a slide ready and have it have it up there, but uh, it's been a crazy week. <laughs> it's been, I was going to have a slide up here because a visual is worth a thousand words, but I encourage you, if you say, Pastor, I just, I have no idea what you're talking about, then in the back of most Bibles, in the back of most Bibles, where your old bulletins are found, okay? If you ever want to know what happened to your old bulletins, that's where they are. In the back of most of your Bibles, there are maps. And I would be willing to venture a guess that in one of those maps would be the map of the exodus of the children of Israel. Usually it's one of the first or second maps. Let's see, I've, I've never even cracked open that section of my Bible, and this particular Bible, but oh, there it is, the route of the Exodus. And you'll find it in there, and you'll see that God took them all the way down south, way down to where they were camped right on the edge of the Red Sea. The Red Sea is a pretty, uh, pretty big body of water. It'd be, it'd be farther across than the Lake of Michigan. Let's put it that way. And if you say, what's a geographic reference? You say, it'd be thicker than or wider than from here to Chicago going across Lake Michigan. You say, that's a pretty big body of water now God led them there if you'll notice in Exodus chapter 14 and verse 1 and 2 you notice that God specifically said Moses I want you to tell them to go that way and they all said well God that's fine if that's the way you want us to go we'll go that way well the thing is sometimes God has bigger plans than you and God has bigger plans than me in mind and so God led them down and uh, notice in verse 3 Notice in verse 3 of Exodus chapter 14. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land, the wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he shall follow after them, and I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his hosts that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. It's interesting as God led them in this way, it, there was a reason. Now, I want to, just to kind of set the scene. So the children of Israel have left. They're now down in the wilderness. They're parked by the Red Sea. They really can't go anywhere. And God says, and I'm going to do something, and I've got a reason for this. And he says, now listen. But there's, there's a spiritual significance. So how does this apply to me? Well, it's interesting. This particular picture represents to you and I uh, faith, obedience 
to the Lord. Now, there's one thing that the Lord Jesus Christ asked each one of us to do after we came to faith in him. All right, he says, listen, I'll die. Jesus said, I'll die on the cross and pay your way to heaven. Wonderful. He says, I'll die and be buried and raise again. I'll go back up to heaven. I'll give you a wonderful promise. It's in Romans 10, 13. It says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's a promise. He said, I'll make a way. Now, listen, you need to respond to that. Now, once we respond to that, once we believe that, once we trust in that, he said, this is what I want you to do. I would like you to trust me on this, but you need to be baptized. You need to follow the Lord, what the Bible calls believer's baptism. You say, well, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. I I know I have Jesus in my heart. I I know I'm going to heaven. I I know I believe that he is the son of God. And Jesus says, yeah, yeah, we're all good on that. But I'm asking you to trust me and I'm asking you to obey me. Now, there's very, very, very few things that Jesus asks us or even commands us to do, but one of the first steps is believer's baptism. My friend, there is no mistake that as God led the children of Israel out, he led them not the easy way, but he led them a different way, and he led them right to the edge of the Red Sea, and God parted the Red Sea. In just a few minutes, God's going to part the Red Sea, and they're going to march through that Red Sea. But that was an act of faith, and it was an act of obedience. The Bible says in the New Testament, they were all baptized unto Moses. They were immersed in the body of the Red Sea. They went under the Red Sea. They actually went through it. Now, that's interesting. I think I've shown you this, but you say, well, pastor, what is, what's the significance of baptism? I like to liken it to two. First of all, it's this ring right here, okay? It's like this ring. This, this ring is a very specific kind of ring. What kind of ring is this? This is a wedding ring. It's a wedding ring, all right? Now, uh, Tim and uh, Amanda have a little girl. Now, now this ring here in and of itself doesn't mean a whole lot, all right? If I were to happen to take this off and Lydia would happen to find it or maybe she would find uh, Pastor Tim's and put that ring on her little finger. Is, is Lydia married, yes or no? No, she's not, all right? This is just a symbol, a sign of a decision or a promise that I made to that lovely lady right down there, amen? This is an outward symbol of an inward commitment all right number one that's what baptism represents it's an outward sign of an inward commitment that I've made to the Lord Jesus Christ it's a wonderful visual illustration as well so if I would say this was the water right here of of the of the baptistry we'll do the wave here the all right when the preacher gets down in now listen when 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 you go down into that body of water whatever it is and you go down in the water guess what that looks like it looks like the cross You know what you're saying when you get baptized? When you go down the water, you say, I believe Jesus died on the cross for me. When the pastor puts you under the water, it says, I believe not only Jesus died, but I believe he was buried for me. And when the pastor brings you back up out of the water, it says, I believe Jesus rose again for me. It's a statement of faith that Jesus died and Jesus was buried and Jesus rose again and you're saying to yourself and to the whole wide world listen my friend I'm not trusting in my good works I'm not trusting in my church membership I'm trusting the fact that Jesus died on the cross he was buried he rose again that's the only thing getting me to heaven it's a statement of faith it's an act listen of faith and number two it's an act of obedience And that's what God asks for us. That's our part. It's the responsibility of the redeemed. Now, that's the spiritual significance uh, in this. Now, let's go back to our text this morning. I want to point out three truths, three truths about faith and obedience. Three truths about faith and obedience. Number one, uh, we've already read the uh, passage in Exodus chapter 14 and verse 1 and 2, uh, but this, uh, number one, let me make a statement number one. God leads us on purpose and with a purpose. Number one, God leads us on purpose and with a purpose God the Bible says in Exodus 14 and 1 and 2 God said Moses you tell them that this is the way they're going to go so God had a purpose and it was for a purpose now let me let me give you here a non-biblical statement a non-biblical statement 
You might have heard this said in time to time in your life or in my life. Somebody might have said it to you. You and I might have said it to somebody else. You might have heard this statement. It says, God will never put on you more than you can handle. How many have ever heard that statement? You might have heard that statement. You know that, you know, that's a good Hallmark slogan, but it's not a Bible truth. It's not a biblical truth. I think about this. Hey, hey, what if we were to ask Job when all 10 of his children were died and he lost everything and said, Job, you okay with this? Job wasn't okay with that. I, I think about, we, we might inquire of the Apostle Paul. The Bible says he spent a day and a night floating in the Mediterranean Ocean on, on shipwreck, shipwreckage, and say, as we would float along with the Apostle Paul and say, Apostle Paul, you doing okay with all this? He'd probably say, no, I, I'm not doing okay with this. I'm about to die. I think about asking Miss Naomi in the Old Testament, the mother-in-law of Ruth, and say, Naomi, your husband died, and your two sons died, and now you're stuck, you're a widow, and you're all alone in a foreign country. You, you doing okay? Naomi would say, I'm not doing okay. I think of others in the Bible. I think of Joseph. If we were to go down in that prison cell where Joseph was sitting bound and chained in an Egyptian jail being falsely accused of sexual assault, we say, Joseph, you doing okay with this? He would say, no, I'm not okay with this. My friends, the situation we have here in Exodus chapter 14 is that God led them to something greater than themselves. They were down in the middle of the desert. They were camped right on the edge of the, uh, the Red Sea. They couldn't go forward, and they were being surrounded by Pharaoh's army. And Pharaoh's army was there to kill them, capture them, and bring them back. Sometimes, my friends, God will lead you and I. I just want to make this statement. God, you will lead you and I to things. Now listen, God will lead you and I to things that are far greater than what we can handle. God's going to lead you to things, whether it's situations or circumstances. It, it could be health, it could be finances, it could be with your children, it could be with your family. God is going to lead you and God is going to lead me as his children to situations. Listen, it's just beyond us. We just say, God, I don't, I don't have the wisdom to figure this one out. God, I don't have the ability uh, to answer this. Now listen, let me finish that statement. God will lead you and I to it so that he can lead us through it. Now that's a biblical statement. I draw that, derive that from Exodus chapter 14 because in just a few verses, God had led them to the brink of the Red Sea, but he brought them to, the br he brought them to it so that he could lead them through it because you know who gets the glory when that happens? God does. The children of Israel couldn't swim across the Red Sea. It was too big. They couldn't walk across the Red Sea. It was too deep. You know what they needed? They needed a God in heaven who could part the waters and a God who could do the impossible. Let me make this three quick observations about this. Number one, God leads on purpose with the purpose. Sometimes that purpose is greater than you. That's in verse 3 if you're taking notes. Just very briefly, I must hasten on. Sometimes that purpose is greater than you. Number two, sometimes that purpose is for God's honor. That's in verse 4. Sometimes God is leading you to things and God is leading you through things because there's a purpose greater than you. Hey, let, let me just help you out, Christian. It's not all about you. It's a good day in the Christian's life when we back up and stop whining to God and we realize sometimes it's not all about us. Number two, sometimes it, God's purpose is for his honor. And number three, sometimes his purpose is to strengthen our faith. That's in verse 14. I'll let you look that up. Number one, statement number one on faith and obedience. Sometimes, well, all the time, God leads on purpose and with a purpose. Number two, God's leading, God's leading requires faith and obedience God's leading requires faith and obedience I told you a little bit a while ago I was going to ask you to turn to the book of Habakkuk would you do that with me this morning Habakkuk chapter 2 Habakkuk chapter 2 if you don't know where that is grab your concordance if you came in a little late you can listen but in Habakkuk chapter 2 in verse 4 very important verse in fact there's only three chapters in the book of Habakkuk if you get to Zephaniah Haggai Zechariah Malachi you've gone a little too far stop uh, put the reverse on in Habakkuk chapter 2 look at verse 4 behold his soul which is lifted up uh, lifted up is not upright in him then the Bible makes a definitive statement there's a colon there but the just shall live by his faith 
The just shall live by his faith or faith in God. Do you know that's the first time in four references in the Bible that the Bible tells us a very important truth? I'll give you the first one, Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4. The second one we find in Romans chapter 1 and verse 17. If you're taking notes, Romans 1 17 says this, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. You say, where is it written? Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4. But that's not the only time it's mentioned in the New Testament. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 11, the Bible says, but that no man is justified by the law and the sight of God. It is evident for the just shall live by faith. That's referencing back to Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4. In Hebrews, the last place you see it in your Bible, in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 38, the Bible says it now, the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Now listen, my friends, sometimes God's leading doesn't make rational sense, but it does make spiritual sense. Uh, faith, listen, faith is trusting in the wisdom of God when his ways are beyond our understanding. That's what faith is. Faith is trusting in the goodness of God when his ways are unpleasant to us. Faith is trusting in the power of God when his ways are fearful to us. But my point and my purpose is this. Number one, in God's leading, God is always leading you and I on purpose. Number two, in God's leading, if we're going to follow God's leading, my friend, it's going to take faith and it's going to take obedience. God's going to lead you some down, some, and you're going to be like, whoa, 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 God, I, I don't know what's behind that door. Or, or God, I do know what's behind that door, and God, I don't like what's behind that door. And God says this, do you trust me? Will you obey me? When God leads, sometimes in our lives, it requires faith and obedience. Lastly, third truth I want to point out from this text this morning. Number one, God always leads on purpose. Number two, in God's leading, it requires on our part faith and obedience. And number three, God's leading is always accompanied with God's blessings. Turn back with me. If you, if you have turned away, go back with me to the book of Exodus chapter 14. We're going to pick up our reading in verse 11. So the children of Israel at the brink of the Red Sea. Pharaoh's armies are marching down on them. The, the, the dust is going up in the air. The swords are coming out. The spears are being readied. The cavalry's about to charge. And they're either going to get dead or they're going to get captured and enslaved again. This is where we pick up our reading in verse 11. And they, this is the people of Israel, they said unto Moses, because there was no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? This is a get back to that. Hey, listen, sometimes Christians, we don't understand what God's doing. And sometimes we don't appreciate what God's doing. And sometimes it's beyond what, uh, what to under, for us to understand what God's doing. Look at verse 12. Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians, for it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than we should die in the wilderness. And verse 13, we pick up our narrative. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. Now there is, uh, and what is about to happen is this. Moses went to God. God says, Moses, you take that rod and you lift up that rod and you lift it up over the ocean. Don't smack it. Don't touch it. Don't wave it. Don't say anything. He said, you just lift up that rod. And he said, the waters are going to part. Now, many of us that are old enough can remember the Charlton Heston movie, all right? I don't recommend it. It's completely unbiblical. But we all remember that the waters parted and probably about what we would see about the size of this middle section, maybe, maybe the size of this auditorium and the people followed, filed through. Now, listen. There were, according to the estimates of the, based on the genealogies and the reckoning here, there was upwards in excess of over 3 million people that had to cross a body of water larger than the lake, larger and deeper than the Lake of Michigan, all in one night. Now, if God would have opened up a channel 60 foot wide, it would have taken them a month to get across, to get 3 million people. 
the estimates are, if it, but do, those who are a little smarter than me and do the mathematical equation, that it would take them, if they were to traverse the Red Sea in less than eight hours, they would have to walk 5,000 people abreast at a time, over a mile wide a parting of the Red Sea to get all three million by not only, not only and those of you who have children know that children don't walk fast all right especially when you're walking through waters of water and then you got the cows and the, uh, the sheep and the goats and you got everything else to travel with you it took a really big opening and it took a really big time for them to get across the Red Sea my friends listen God's leading yes it's on purpose number two yes it requires the faith in the obedience of God's people but listen my friends when we walk with God and we obey God in faith and obedience you know what it's it, you know, it's uh, uh, favored with it's favored with God's power and God's presence the blessings of God my friends listen what a wonderful thing you say pastor why should I walk with God number one because God has a purpose in your life and sometimes that purpose is greater than you you say pastor it's hard to walk with God and I'll agree with you on that it's not always easy you know what it takes it takes faith and it takes obedience you say but pastor why should I walk with God because when we follow the leading of God listen when we walk in the journey of faith when we walk with God it's always accompanied by the power and the presence and the blessings of God it's a wonderful thing to walk with God on the journey of faith. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning and we thank you, Lord, for this privilege. Lord, we thank you that you reached down out of this sin-sick world and God, you rescued us, you saved us through the marvelous gospel of your Son. Father, we thank you for that. And God, we ask, dear Lord, that you would please help us. Lord, we thank you that you initiated this relationship. God, help us to do our part. Help us to trust you. And Lord, help us to obey you. Lord, I pray that we would understand and we would know that accompanying through the journey of faith is the sweet, wonderful blessings of your power and of your presence. And Lord, we thank you for that in Jesus' name. And amen. If we'll stand this morning with our heads bowed and our eyes closed as the instruments begin to play a verse of invitation if you'd like to stand this morning if you'd like to pray for any reason